Life Stories Live. Life Story on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, it's evening for us, but our speaker, it's early morning, as you'll find out where, where he is. But tonight, we welcome you to join us on this wonderful story. If you need any help, if you need prayer, then please contact us on our hotline, plus 447943550287. You can also go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. There you'll find lots of help, lots of information about the work we're doing with Life Stories. So it's good to have you all with us tonight. And uh, as I said, our speaker, it's early hours of the morning because he is in Perth, Australia. And our speaker tonight is Trevor Stiles. Trevor joined the Australian Navy. He was two years with the Australian Navy. He saw active service in Brunei and Vietnam. And then he became a credit manager for several large companies. And lots of things happened in his life, which he's going to share with you. But now he is the chairman of the Governor's Prayer Breakfast, a very responsible job there in Australia. And so right now I'm going to hand over to Trevor, who's going to share his story with you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Alan. Um, first of all, I'd just like to share one scripture that, uh, as you all understand, as I share my story, why, how important it is for us. That we, it's, it's just in uh, 1 Peter 5, 6, it simply says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And the key thing there is that God will take a hold of your life and he will exalt you. And in due time, he will use you to be a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. As Alan said, I'm down here in the southwest corner of uh, Australia, in, uh, in Perth. And I was born a little further south of Perth in a bus town called Busseldon, born into a post-war family in 1948, so that's a long time ago. My grandfather served in the army in the First World War. My father was in the Second World War. And um, as I, he, um, my father and mother separated when I was about five years of age. Being born into a post-war family in Australia, we did have the depression and so forth. Although I um, didn't um, lack anything at all, my mother, looked after me with my grandmother as well. I have a sister and a brother. Um, my brother, if I could just say he passed away last year. Um, I just um, briefly, he always used to say to me, I believe in God, but not Jesus. And he passed away last year, but on the Saturday afternoon before he passed away, by the grace of God, he was saved. And he died less than 24 hours later. So that's the God I serve. And, you know, I guess what I would say to believers, don't give up on praying for your family and others because um, it may be decades before um, something might happen. But that was my brother. And um, <clears throat> we lived in a town called Bustleton where I grew up as a, a toddler and so forth. Then when my father left us, we moved to uh, another bigger town called Bunbury where I went to school. And um, in Bunbury, uh, my grandmother and, and mother and auntie looked after us and raised us. We were a poor family, but um, we used to go to, I, used, I was taken to Sunday school, I taught scripture. Uh, I used to go to church when I was uh, 12 or so years of age. I would uh, be an altar boy in the church. And I, I know I used to go to church probably four or five times a week. Um, serving at the altar and uh, doing various things. <clears throat> anyway, I, I had this opportunity to be a carpenter. A friend of mine, next door neighbour, he wanted me to be an apprentice carpenter and uh, we were going to build um, cottages and boats near the seashore in uh, south of Western Australia. However, my mother wasn't so keen to let me do that. Um, and you know, that place we were going to was only probably it would have been less than um, 50 miles from where I lived. But uh, then I said to my mum, well, look, I think I'll join the Navy as a musician. So I did an audition and uh, they accepted me to into the musical uh, branch of the Royal Australian Navy, where I um, 
they gave me a French horn and a bugle and some drums, and they um, spent two years teaching me music. However, at the end of the two years, um, I failed my sixth grade exam, and they said that some people can hammer nails in walls and some people can play music, but that music wasn't uh, for myself. I was, I was 15 years of age when I joined the Navy. And I think Alan said two years, I actually spent nine years in the Navy. And um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I moved into um, another branch of the Navy for the next seven years. And I ended up um, in, with, as a petty officer uh, and uh, then, so and uh, during this time, in um, I think it was about nineteen, the mid nineteen sixties, the Vietnam conflict was um, happening. There was some issues in the Malacca Straits with Brunei, so we spent time there. We spent time um, dealing with um, the uh, uh, arms smuggling across the Malacca Straits to Malaysia. And during that time, from time to time, we would escort a troop carrier to Vietnam. Um, and then uh, we'd go back to our deployment in, um, in and out of Singapore. Anyway, um, a few years later, I was posted to a destroyer where we were deployed in Vietnam for nine months. And during that, during that deployment, uh, we um, were up, up in, near towards North Vietnam when we received uh, two missiles uh, into our ship, which uh, injured several people and sadly killed two sailors. Um, and uh, both of the sailors I had a bit to do with, one of them I worked very closely with, he was only 18 years of age. And of course that um, is quite upsetting. And even today, if I go to our uh, national capital, Canberra, and um, see these two names on the war memorial, it's quite an emotional moment, so it's... <laughs> But I just thank God that um, any trauma that might have come out of that, uh, he seems to have um, helped me through it all. Uh, so that was my Navy service. During my time in the Navy, I met my wife, Cheryl, who um, it was a, a British ship, actually, that was in port, in uh, port of Fremantle, which is the port that serves Perth. And there was an aircraft carrier there, and they put on a dance for their sailors and invited a thousand girls to come to this dance. So uh, my wife, Cheryl, was there at uh, 18 years of age, and I, I was asked to take some of the uh, British sailors to this dance, and as a consequence, I was invited to be part of the dance. And I met my wife, who had gone to the dance to meet a British sailor, but she ended up with an Aussie. And um, we, we, got, we um, spent the next 12 months uh, courting, and we were married in 1970. Um, and I still had two years left to serve in the Navy, and I was 
Now, my discharge in 1972, uh, honourable discharge, and uh, we came to Perth. We settled in Perth that year. Um, and I, um, we, we were married for approximately six years, 1976. And this is where our life started to change. In 1976, we thought it was time to um, have a family. And my wife and I, we tried, but nothing happened. 1977, 1978 goes by, nothing, nothing. The uh, medical profession and the scientists had, had a go at using different um, medications and, um, and, and, and uh, treatments to, to get the, uh, my wife to get her pregnant. But um, in 1979, on Christmas Day, that's the 25th of December, my wife, in desperation, after Christmas lunch, just laid on the bed and called out to God. She had been, um, uh, in her younger years, involved in the Baptist church in the east coast of Australia. She cried out to God and said, look, God, I'm desperate. Um, I'd like to have a baby. And to cut a long story short, 25th of September, 1980, our daughter Nicole was born. And um, after about two weeks getting over the uh, sort of early days of having a new child in the house, uh, my wife said to me, I realised that I had a, my prayers been answered and off to church she goes. As for me, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. Don't, don't give me this sort of stuff, you know. The Navy had taken me away from my um, religious or um, Christian walk, as it does, and uh, you end up, uh, probably the best way to describe it is whatever sailors did, I, I got involved in drinking and so forth. The only thing I didn't do was get a tattoo. But um, that was those early years. So here we are in Perth. Um, God's answered a prayer. Uh, my wife's story, I, I don't need to go into it. I'm saying go to church, but I'm not interested at all. And then a, another daughter came along, which the um, doctors said should not, shouldn't have happened. It wasn't uh, scientifically possible according to them, but God had other plans for that. So we, um, <clears throat> uh, so Cheryl's off to church. I'm, I'm playing cricket, um, uh, continuing with my sort of, uh, Post Navy lifestyle, which was very wasn't much different to when I was in the Navy, until um, one day I was um, in a bar, in a in a, a bar in a in a tavern, playing darts and drinking beer with some of the cricketing buddies, and as I went to the bar one day, uh, I just was buying a few pots of beer, and as I picked those three pots of beer up. Yeah, I never forget this. Uh, inside of me, a voice spoke. Nobody else would have heard it but me. And this voice said, there's more to life than this, Trevor. Now, did anything happen after that? I would probably say not a lot, although I've never forgotten that moment and uh, precisely where it was. And it was probably in 1982, 83 when it happened. And I just went on merrily with my life. Um, and then um, I was uh, got interested in spiritual things. I, I had this idea in my mind, you know, universal um, religion into heaven, doesn't matter who you are, God is mercy, merciful enough that doesn't matter what you do, you'll get into heaven. Some people would put it this way. Uh, every side of the mountain takes you to the top. But that all changed one day about a few months later. I was heading back to work after lunch. And as I um, start, opened the door to the workplace, this same voice spoke again. And the words it, that was uh, spoken to me, it, it, it was more than just a thought. It was like speaking from the inside into my ears, saying, you're wrong, Trevor. Jesus is the only way. Um, did a lot happen after that? No, you know, we human beings are very... You know, we're hard to crack sometimes. Anyway, <clears throat> I just continued on for that year. It was in 1983. In August 1983, um, this is where it started to really, God started to really shake me. The crisis came. 
and I was working for a large company. You probably would have, people who are in the UK would have heard of BOC. I worked for them um, for 14 years. And then um, we were up to sort of uh, no good, uh, two or three of us. Uh, we got caught and um, the manager, my manager lost his job. Um, I decided to um, go and just tell the general manager all that had happened, what we were up to and how we were, I suppose, misappropriating funds. And uh, although that's probably too strong a word, we we're probably just keeping records incorrectly that um, favoured ourselves. And um, so that all happened there. And uh, the general manager said to me when I met him on this particular Monday, he said, come back next week and I'll let you know what I'm going to do with you. So a week goes by and you could imagine how anxious I was. I just had a new family, a young girls, my wife, our home, our uh, mortgage, and all that was on the line. And uh, I didn't know what to do. But I did discover, my wife said to me, there's three women since I be, got, started going back to church, three women have been praying for you. They had these uh, groups called prayer triplets. And um, so these women were praying for me. And <clears throat> I uh, went back the following Monday to see the general manager. And he said, you can stay and work for us, but you, need, you will be demoted from a supervisor to a senior clerk. stories live so that that was the crisis time and as i um sat and pondered what had happened um i started to realize that one of the key things of being a christian is to is forgiveness so i uh the ladies who had sort of reported our wrongdoings i just asked them if they would forgive me well i must say they were shocked when i asked them to do that um, they, and, and funnily enough, soon after all of that, they left. I continued as a senior clerk for a few months, and then I um, uh, was reinstated to a supervisor. And in fact, when I was reinstated to a supervisor, I was supervising twice as many people, and uh, it was a much bigger job. Uh, but during that time, um, I said to God, I, my prayer was, and, you know, quite arrogantly and um, probably off the day, I would think it wasn't right. But my prayer was, Lord, I'll give you two years to prove yourself to me. And, uh, and that I would go to church every Sunday, maybe twice on Sundays. I would get involved in the various men's ministries and um, meetings of, uh, that were going on. And so I did that, and that was in August 1983 when I prayed that prayer. And um, in, in uh, May 1985, uh, I was at a meeting, a church service in the evening, 
And then for some reason, I was sitting on the front row. Normally, people who are curious and don't want to be there sit at the back. But this night, I sat at the front row. I was on my own. And they, the, um, the preacher preached the word of God from uh, the cripple at Bethesda Pool. I, I know that was the message. But it wasn't so much that that impacted me. It was at the end of it all, he simply said, uh, if you want to hand your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and enter the kingdom of God, um, let me pray for you. And he said at the end, two words were, why wait? And when he said those words, uh, I just wept. I just wept. Tears just poured out of me um, right from deep within in me and, you know, the only way I could explain it, God apprehended me that night and I just wept. And for a whole week, I was weeping and I went to this, got with this men's prayer group and um, spent the whole week with, uh, you know, each morning, early in the morning with them. And I was baptized the next Sunday. I couldn't wait for that to happen. And then it was <clears throat> just um, being part of the church. And I stayed at that place where I was um, saved for about uh, five years or probably a bit less. And then one Sunday, or sorry, one Thursday, I was just praying and I, I really was, uh, you know, God had really got me um, on my knees and I was praying and uh, it was like a sort of thought. It wasn't the voice this time. You need to move to another church. Um, so um, I said to my wife on that Thursday morning, we need to move to another church. And she said to me, when I said today, Right now, we moved this weekend. It's all over where we were. Interesting enough, she said to me, when I walked out of church last Sunday, she said, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're, this is the last Sunday you'll be here. And uh, she said, she said, well, my husband would never leave this place. You know? And one thing about my wife, she would never, she, she wanted to be in another place. I know that she had some encounters with God and she felt that, she wasn't being fed uh, enough where she was. But one thing, she wouldn't move unless we both agreed. And I can share a couple of those times with you as we go through this uh, testimony. <clears throat> so we moved to a um, what would be called a Pentecostal church. Uh, and I went, I've been there for just a few months. And um, they asked me if I would join the leadership team of this fellowship. Having just been saved for two or three years, I, I, I wondered if it was a good idea. However, um, it became clear to me that I needed to do that. So I um, agreed to join that uh, board there, that church board. And um, I stayed on there for about 12 years in this particular church. Many, many things happened there. We um, started a television ministry. At that time, it was called Priority One. It's since been shifted to um, Florida, and it's known as Influence Living, which uh, you can, it's all on YouTube. It's a similar thing to what um, BMF is doing, uh, sharing testimonies of people's lives and how God changed their lives. So I was involved with that for about 10 years. I also got involved in an international television ministry, which... Uh, held crusades worldwide and had the opportunity to get involved with um, three crusades, uh, in one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, one in Auckland, and there'd be, you know, 20, 30,000 people at these crusades in uh, auditorium, in uh, entertainment centres and uh, in tents and so forth. That was quite an experience um, working, and we are working with the Americans, which... Um, they, uh, they operate a bit different to Aussies and New Zealanders, but uh, nevertheless, we just humbled ourselves and, and worked under their guidance. So that was uh, things. Then um, in the mid-90s, um, a, a gentleman, a preacher, came to our church and he pulled me aside and he spoke to me uh, for about three minutes. And I've still got the tape, if you can see it here. It's just a uh, cassette tape, which is old technology. I still hold that, and I um, have prayed about it. And what what um, I would say happened with that, I just put it aside and used to just pray about it from time to time, but didn't really. Uh, I just had this view that you just don't 
try and make things happen that have been said on there. And the essence of the, of the, of the message was that the Lord was speaking, saying, I will join you to a man of God. And you will love it. You'll serve him. You'll do all sorts of things. And you'll even take risks for him. Um, a bit like, uh, I think it was Jonathan and David. And so that, that's, that was about 1994, 95. Um, I continued to serve in that church. Uh, many, many things we did. We had crusades in, in uh, Perth with uh, Billy Graham's brother-in-law, Leighton Ford, um, and Franklin Graham, and different ones like that. Until um, 2001, <clears throat> I was uh, just sitting in my room, prayer room, which I... Life Stories Live.